This is the fourth Cloud Native, Cloud Native Computing Foundation webinar. Um, as you will have seen, if you're looking at the chat, I've put a link in there to the previous uh, webinar, so I would encourage you to check those out. And also, I've put a link in there to the next webinar that we're going to have after this one, which is with William from the newest project that we've announced as, the C as part of the CNCF, and that's Linkerd. I suggest that you go and sign up for that right now. Today, however, we have Alexis Richardson, who is the chairperson of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's Technical Oversight Committee, and he's also the CEO of Weaveworks. He's going to be explaining what Cloud Native is and why you really should care about that. Um, in previous webinars, if you've been here before, you will, have, uh, you will have seen that we normally ask you to keep all questions to the end, but I've changed my mind on that one because I thought that it made it, made it a little bit stale. So during the uh, webinar, please use either the Q&A box down the bottom or the chat window that you've seen I've already been typing into, and I will find opportune moments to interrupt Alexis and ask him questions. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Some people are still joining, but I think it's I think it's better to just kick it off now. Alexis, are you ready? Hi, Mark. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Ready to go? I am ready to go. Excellent. Take it away. Thank you, Mark. So, hi, everybody. My name is Alexis. I'm the chair of the TOC for CNCF, as well as the CEO and co-founder of WeWorks. I see that the uh, date is wrong on that. It should say 22nd of February 2017. Um, the oh, and that's correct. Twenty third. There you go. Um, just to let you know, if you do send questions on the chat room, I won't see them because I'm looking at a full screen here display of the slides. So Mark will see them and he'll pass them through to me on a Slack window we have open separately. So if there's a delay, don't panic. So what is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation? It is all about open source com cloud computing for applications. Not the same thing as open which is about infrastructure, for example. And our goal is to curate and promote a trusted toolkit for modern architectures. So what is cloud native? This is a concept pioneered by several people around the same time, sort of five to 10 years ago, including Netflix, which I think is probably the largest and most famous early company to do this. And for them, it was a very practical matter. They were trying to build a global platform for delivering video to consumers, i.e. us, that, would, that just worked, which meant it had to be always up, and they had to keep on improving it so the customer experience got better and better and better. They've talked about this many times. I particularly recommend the slides linked here from an Amazon uh, event talking about what they consider to be cloud native at the time, web scale, global, highly available, consumer facing, which brings with it particular needs. And the, the, key, the key to all of this is they wanted to achieve two things at once and do so at scale. And those were speed and access, meaning specifically they wanted to deliver changes to their software much faster than anyone had done before, up to thousands of times a day, uh, in order to make for better consumer experiences. And they wanted the accessibility of the system to be very high. So they were not willing to tolerate outages because they really felt the, they just, the CEO in, in a letter to investors once described it as the moment of truth. When you plop down on the couch and you're thinking, you know, what am I going to do next? Shall I read a book or shall I watch something on Netflix? And if it just works, that's very appealing to you as a potential Netflix customer. And they really thought it was critical to being a good provider of video. And of course, they've been very successful with that model. And it's led to other people copying the approach of being you know, always on and very rapidly iterating their systems using technologies that we'll talk about today. Do read these slides if you want more detail on, on how they see the story. And so this concept of cloud native grew and grew and, and the sort of techniques uh, really power a whole industry today, um, very much headquartered around islands of technology like Silicon Valley and places in China and Europe, et cetera. But you know, growing all the time, and what's happening with, with the Cloud Native Foundation today, and I'll be talking about, is really democratizing these tools. Does that mean, of course, that anybody can be like Netflix? Well, we'd like to think so, even these guys. Maybe we can dream of not being a donkey anymore, but in fact, all being sparkly unicorns. But in reality, there is this need for speed that I re referenced before. And how does that play out? Here's some numbers from the Puppet Lab Survey State of DevOps 2015. They do this once a year. This is a, this is a good snapshot I took recently. 
uh, comparing what they consider to be low and high performance in uh, important metrics. And I'm just going to pull out one here, mean time to recovery, which is the one that directly relates to Netflix's need for speed. Um, they noticed in their survey, which is very comprehensive, I mean, they get eight to 10,000 respondents. So it's a credible survey. They found that the difference between high and low performers measured in percentiles was nearly 50 times in 2014. Then you go 48x on the right. And that's already very big, but it's grown even more. I mean, in the year between 2014 and 2015 surveys, it went to 168x. And, you know, look at the other numbers as well. It's just extraordinary the difference between people who are on the fast path and people who are sort of stumbling along. And it's the difference between a company that can make several hundred changes to its systems, you know, per day across the whole company uh, and a company that has to make, you know, has to have months of meetings just to make one change to the color of a homepage. So what is it about cloud native that we think makes you go fast in this sense? So at Weaveworks, we are a cloud native company. We decided um, when we built our own product to experiment by dog feeding everything and being very cloud native ourselves. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that next in order to make this very concrete. Here's our product, Weave Cloud, which is about helping people build cloud native apps. And there's a nice screenshot of it on the right. Lots of different components uh, for deployment and monitoring and so forth. And here's an, a slightly old picture of an architecture showing you multiple moving parts. And as you can see, this is not a traditional web app. There's, there's several, several pieces, and this is a system that had to you know, bring together different pieces of functionality and run in the cloud and be available and enable us to change it quickly. And we soon turn that into the, these business requirements, so 24-7, always on, always supportable, available globally. And the team really wanted to focus very hard on application development. They didn't want to spend time being AMI sysadmins on Amazon or plumbing around with infrastructure. We also felt very strongly that as a startup, we had to scale our costs in line with demand. So we wanted to make sure that if a component uh, was demanded and needed to scale, let's say a piece that did monitoring, we could do that without incurring cost in other parts of the system that might say do visualization and deployment. So we needed a componentized model. We didn't want to spend money integrating other people's software, so we wanted to pick software that already worked with other things. And we wanted to run our application Weave Cloud anywhere. Right now it's on Amazon, but we know that we can lift and shift it to other clouds, uh, including uh, data centers behind the firewall. That gives us comfort that we can grow our business uh, reasonably predictably as as we get more customers. And so what did that mean in terms of the technology? What did we learn from that? I mean, this is sort of fairly predictable if you've been watching the space for some time, but it is worth understanding what, what's going on here. The most important thing is automation. Automation, automation, automation. And this is end to end from the developers, your fingertips, all the way through to alerts on the operations screen. Automate all the things, and this means technologies like CI-CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, CI is in, in quite widespread use already. CD is becoming more of a thing now. Uh, orchestration, which I was personally very skeptical about uh, a few years ago, uh, thinking that many applications would rather do it manually. But as we've become more comfortable using technologies like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and Messi, we've realized there is tremendous benefit to automating how an app is orchestrated and observability, which is all about automating different components of the logging and monitoring stack in order to simplify how you can control it and get warned of things before they happen if possible. The second thing that you need is, as I mentioned, really you want the ability to focus on the app, not the infrastructure, because uh, of uh, the importance of not getting distracted by administrative concerns, but also portability. To do that, you need standard packaging that just works consistently anywhere. And right now, today, 2017, the leading contender for that technology is containers, of course, Docker containers and other sorts of containers. It may change in the future to unikernels or who knows what else or functions, but the main thing is that containers are key today. And finally, you need to understand a lot of new patterns of the type pioneered by Netflix years ago doing your monitoring, logging, uptime management, and so on. And this is all about microservices. There are other patterns, but I think microservices is the 
is the big name, the big ticket pattern for these kind of cloud deployments. I'm just going to take a pause. Uh, Mark, how are we doing? We're good. We've got a couple of questions in. Uh, Sashin Sashdeva, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, asked, so could we then say that cloud native is a de facto standard for cloud pass, as in platform as a service? Um, let me go back to this picture. Uh, I think PaaS is often associated with 12-factor models like Heroku. So I think, you know, Cloud Native is about a more general set of patterns, uh, patterns for scaling and making your applications more available, regardless of whether they're 12-factor web apps or even they could be data streams processing. Down here on the bottom left in our picture, we have a bunch of monitoring technology going on, which is by no means traditionally associated with PaaS. But if you... If you free your mind of PaaS as traditionally understood, then I think it is, it is the basis of the next generation of platforms. So in that sense, I would say yes. There's a second question here, and I'm gonna mispronounce the name again. I apologize to these attendees. Srika Aranthula asks, so how then is it that Weave can run anywhere? They, I think Srika wants to dive down a bit into the details. He said he's using HashiCorp tools for this, or is it just because of containers? It's, we are using HashiCorp tools. We're also using containers. We're also using Kubernetes. We're also using Prometheus. What have those things got in common? They are open source tools that we can deploy where we want to and uh, have a relatively low cost of integration. Uh, that is what gives you a degree of portability. Uh, containers are really fundamental to this because you can package any software and run it consistently uh, pretty much anywhere. I think that's the, that's the secret recipe. Of course, uh, running things Running the same code in two different places does not guarantee it will work the same way in two different places as people found in the 90s with Java. Uh, you could have a big app that ran happily on a server and just would fail to run on a laptop or worst case, a phone. But, uh, you know, modulo, those kinds of obvious changes, I think you're looking for sort of similar functionality. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. That's the questions for now. I'll, I'll probably interrupt you a little bit later when more come in. Let's move on then. So just to drill into those three points a little bit more, um, I think of automation in terms of this A, B, C, D, E uh, mnemonic. Uh, apps, A, A for apps, are built and tested locally, uh, and automatically built using a CI. In this case, at WeaveWorks, we like to use Circle for our builds. Doesn't mean that it's the best one, uh, just the one that works for us. Uh, then the container images are generated from this process and land in a container repo, such as Key. And then there is a deployment step, which takes things out of the image repo and dumps them into an execution environment of your choice. And in our case, we're using WeFlux for deployment and using Kubernetes for our primary execution environment for our WeCloud app. And we not only do this ourselves, but we think other people should do this too. They might use different components, but they would ultimately be doing the same end-to-end -end automation for their deployment. What lessons learned? I and mean, what else? I mentioned tools. So, We've already had some questions from the, from the audience, but open source is key to the tools here. I'm not saying that the tools provided by cloud providers are not good. I'm just saying that they are ones which won't run in every cloud or behind the firewall. So you need to take into account if you're using things like um, SQS on Amazon, you need to, to be aware that if you want to run somewhere else, you'll need to think of an alternative. Some clouds have really amazing tools that you can end up with. Uh, apps that have like attributes like they use big table on, on, on Google Cloud for example and benefit from that and they might use Lambda on Amazon and benefit from that so I'm not saying that it's a must-have that every single aspect of your application should work exactly the same on every cloud you might have different flavors but I think I hope you can see the gist is that as a provider you want your business to work everywhere that's that's the key goal And I mentioned this before, but another lesson is, you know, you really want the infrastructure to be boring. That means it might be exciting for the people that run it, but as an app provider, you just want the infrastructure to work and you want to be abstracted from it as much as you can. So using containers is a good idea. Um, in some cases, you could be using an off-the-shelf PaaS or a container as a service capability like uh, Google Kubernetes Engine or Amazon ECS. And I would urge people thinking about this to watch out for what I call the 1% failure problem which is when you have a problem which only occurs 1% of the time. And uh, when you're small scale, that doesn't matter because you know, if it happens one in a hundred times, you know, big deal, you can usually fix it yourself. But if you've got you know, 10 million users and you have a 1% failure problem, that means you have 100,000 unhappy users at any given moment, which is not at all 
what you want if you're trying to run a business. So think about that when you consider your tool choice here, what it means to be truly boring. And then another lesson learned is, you know, we need good patterns. Um, we definitely have people in our team who understand these patterns, but we have to learn stuff ourselves. And I think it's really important to continue to the, the, the journey of sharing what one has learned with people who, who are yet to do it. So uh, learning about microservices and what are called microliths, which are tiny apps that are not, uh, that are monolithic, but very small. Um, the, the famous cattle, not pets pattern, uh, where you can choose any part of your um, app and it'll carry on going because um, it's, uh, it's just cattle. And uh, the idea that observability and control or monitoring, if you prefer, are really baked into every part of the application from day one, including in the development lifecycle and, and other patterns as well. And so in summary, I would like to assert that above all else, Cloud Native is a set of patterns. And just take a pause there for Mark to see if you've got any further questions. Um, there are no other questions. Some people asking about if they'll get the slides later and stuff like that. But right now, no more questions about the talk. Absolutely. The slides will be public and they are Google Slides. So you'll be able to kind of comment on them and share them and copy them and whatever you like. Actually, um, one, just is, came, one just came in, um, which is, could you shed some light on best practices that are used at Weave around uh, the setup of the developer machines in sync or similar to production? So asking about dev prod parity and how you, how you, how you manage that. Well, I'm sitting here in the office right now with uh, our developer experience team, including um, error developer from Twitter, uh, Ilya Dmitrichenko. He's actually working on that right now, and we will be sharing some of that in blogs ourselves in the future. So I'm not going to give you a little verbal brain dump on it. I will say we're trying to be as open as we can about talking about what we do in the hope that other people find it useful. So do look at our blog and also partner blogs. We've, we've written quite a lot of stuff about Kubernetes and Prometheus recently, for example. Well, that's great. What I'll do is I'll drop the link to the Weave blog into the chat now so you can check that out, uh, Srikar. Great. And also one more coming in now. Um, Tom Wilkie says, we use a Terraform module to ensure the infra is consistent. Oh, that's just a tip. That's for you, Srikar. So um, follow up with Tom about that. You may proceed, Alexis. Thank you, thank you. So um, here's a picture of Adrian who used to work at Netflix. Um, Adrian's uh, a very good person to learn patterns from. He has done millions of fantastic presentations on this topic um, up and down the country and all around the world. I recommend looking at his uh, SlideShare page. So going back to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, what is it and what does it do? Uh, it is open source cloud computing for applications, not infrastructure. And we are curating and promoting a trusted toolkit for modern architectures. So I talked about patterns. That's what Cloud Native is. What about the CNCF? Well, in the, if Cloud Native is patterns, then the CNCF is tools and education. So let's talk about that now. Patterns for what? Well, hopefully patterns so that everybody who wants to do this can do it quickly and easily without having to learn from scratch. Things like availability, automation, acceleration. And here are some things that I've mentioned already that these things are, I believe, all related to important patterns in Cloud Native and need to be documented, described, and learned about if you want to do this seriously. But patterns also benefit from having software. You know, isn't it nice when instead of having to learn about something where I'm reading a book from end to end and then implement it yourself, you can just get a piece of software and use it? Um, we had a question earlier about Hashball. We made a very fine product called Console, which helps you do service discovery, which is an important pattern in, uh, in for example, microservices. Now at CNCF, we are trying to identify and promote tools you can trust as part of our toolkit. Um, and here are the ones that we've already looked at and brought into the foundation or are in the process of doing so. Uh, Kubernetes, which is a container orchestration platform. Prometheus, which does monitoring and some kinds of analysis. FluentD, which is a log forwarding tool useful also if you're doing log aggregation. Uh, Open Tracing, which is a toolkit for doing interoperable tracing. Uh, Linkerd, which is going to be presented at the next CNCF webinar, traffic management, routing, proxies. And we're in the process of voting on gRPC and Core DNS, which are respectively uh, transport technologies and um, DNS technology. And there are many more that have come forward and hopefully more to come. Although it looks like there's non-overlap here, we do actually, well, we are perfectly happy to have multiple tools that do the same thing because we do not believe that we are qualified or smart enough 
to identify which tool is going to win. So I don't surprise if you see occasional duplication in, in the future. Well, what might the future look like? Here is a rather marvelous picture by uh, the CNCF and Redpoint and Amplify, a couple of VCs, which we are using to show people what things might look like in the future. Now, some things are out of scope, so you know, we're not planning to have any of the things in the bottom layer, for example, in the CNCF. And all of these projects are projects that may already have a home. So we're not, either, we're not also suggesting that uh, it, it, the CNCF's job is complete when all of these badges are somehow associated with us, but we're showing you what the potential uh, landscape looks like for Cloud Native, and I hope you agree it's, it's quite a big world out there. That, uh, that one needs to understand. But the, the bit that we're most interested in you know, is bit in the middle, or orchestration runtime, some provisioning, and on the right, platforms and observability. I think we'll also probably see some app, app dev, app dev coming in at the top and CI CD, but uh, that's uh, more, more of a new idea. Oh, actually, just let me just go back to this picture. Anybody who wants to look at this in more detail or contribute to it, uh, can go to the GitHub page shown at the bottom, CNCF landscape, where pull requests may be used in order to make changes. And here's that redone as a simplified reference architecture. There's some people like this kind of thing. There's a whole uh, reference architecture you can go look at. I've got it in an appendix at the end of these slides as well. And you know it breaks out into different key areas. And this is you know, how the management layer breaks out. Uh, which should correspond roughly to the thing in the landscape we saw earlier. So I'm trying to separate concerns there to show people what we care about. So that's the software and the tools which are there to implement the patterns so that people can go faster. Why on earth do we also need a foundation? Well, that's a good question. I think what is might be, sorry to interrupt Alexis, but there's a question which is very pertinent to what you're about to talk about, I think, which is that Srikar, one of the guys that asked the question earlier, asked, um, is the plan of the CNCF hosting projects to become something like the Apache Foundation in the future? Is that gonna be answered in the following slides or do you wanna jump into that specifically? I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable to call the CNCF an Apache of Cloud Native. So um, with some slightly different rules because Apache has grown based on a set of assumptions about what projects needed in the 90s when it was founded, in the 2000s when it got going. And it's grown to a large size since then. I think CNCF has an opportunity to, by focusing on a specific area, which is the cloud native area, identify a family of projects that interoperate, which is some of the things that not all Apache software does, uh, that are relevant to a particular purpose, um, rather disparate, and that uh, are governed by a slightly different set of assumptions about how projects work, maybe are supported by a different set of tools and services. But if you're, if you're stepping away from that level of sort of detail for developers and people who run projects, for customers, yes, it's like an Apache of uh, Cloud Native. Apache has been very successful with web and, and big data. We would love to be uh, as successful with Cloud Native. There is one more question which is also related, coming from an anonymous viewer. Um, how are you going to avoid the problems that the OpenStack Foundation, has, sorry, the OpenStack has encountered as a foundation? How are you going to make sure you don't become a big vendor echo chamber? Well, that's an excellent question. I think you should ask yourself the same question again as we go through this last section. Um, but one of the key differences is we are much more strongly empowering individual projects and we're much more strongly empowering the community. And I, I think, I don't think OpenStack is now doing it wrong, but I think they went through a stage of there being a bit too much kind of vendor to developer in the mix and that sort of skewed things for a while. I think they realized that and have sort of pulled away from that and the project is now more healthy. But I, I do think it, you know, a really key difference technically is OpenStack is trying to be a, a, a grand vision, a single massive project, whereas CNCF is much more of a loose, loosely affiliated set of things that work together, not all of which must be used at the same time. So I think that will make it a lot easier thing for things to, to work. In that sense, it's more like Apache, which is quite healthy. And there's one more question coming in just before you jump into the next section, um, which is on a slightly different tack. Uh, how, uh, let me just uh, translate a bit. How, how would you apply cloud native to the serverless world? Is it, is it all encompassing? Is it different? 
Well, that's a good question too. So I mean, if we go back to the landscape, oh, there it is. Um, you know, serverless would be another box in the app def and development uh, row at the top. So I think there's going to be multiple special purpose um, app dev environments of which serverless is one. And now here by serverless, I'm assuming you mean functions as a service like Lambda um, and not just the business model of charging per function call because that is coincidental with serverless today, but is by no means tied to the uh, callbacks model, the event based model. Now, um, I envisage that actually on top of this substrate of orchestration tools like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesos, Nomad, et cetera, there will be 20, 30, or 40 different special purpose app dev environments, all of which solve different problems really, really well, um, including technically verticalized things like functions as a service, but also potentially business verticals like healthcare, for example, or something else, IoT. So I hope that answers your question. We've already had a couple of teams put their name forward for serverless in CNCF, and I expect that it's only a matter of time before we see uh, more. Thank you very much. That's all the questions for now. So what is a foundation? Um, those of you who are old enough to remember Isaac Asimov might have read his foundation series in which the foundation is a benevolent technocracy run by civilized robots. Now, personally, I think this is a pretty good description of many foundations, but it isn't really the primary goal. Is it a federation of collaborating powers? That is also the case. I mean, one of the things that makes foundations more important and more numerous today is whereas Apache came about largely to help developers to collaborate, I think the foundations of the modern era also take fully into account that, that big companies are collaborating here as well, um, both on the uh, provider side, the vendor side, like you know, IBM, Cisco, Google, in the case of CNCF, and on the end user side, companies like eBay, for example. Um, and you'll see that uh, you'll see this more in the future because big companies are now much more willing to contribute to open source and in some cases it's become a differentiator for attracting developers future employees and so how do you do that how do you deal with ip how do you deal with the cost of development and, and sort of amortization of accounting costs that's something where foundations can really really help because they create a, a, a clear legal structure uh, and thereby a clear financial structure for how that works and finally is it a conflict of karmic forces and the answer is yes it is also that because we care about a bunch of things like lock in that i'm going to talk about in a second and developers and productivity and convenience so the linux foundation is one of the best known foundations and i think may even be the oldest although i think the fsf is older um, it's just a bit older than the apache foundation i believe and its primary job is to safeguard linux for the long term and provide a nexus a commons for collaboration and trust around Linux and also uh, promote it as a concept and brand, which I think has been immensely successful. You probably saw a couple of years ago, Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation, which would have been unheard of a decade ago, uh, inconceivable. And so it wasn't a surprise that when the CNCF decided to form, uh, what, it was, what it did was, was it became a subsidiary of the Umbrella Linux Foundation. So the CNCF inherits all of the legal apparatus and kind of bedrock proven foundation and capability from the LF, but can have its own set of, if you like, business and development rules, which allows it to focus on what problems we want to solve in cloud native, which include you know, high velocity development, for example. And so the CNCF really arose by a bunch of companies, Google, CoreOS, Weaveworks, Docker, Cisco, saying, let's do this together. And we thought that was a very good idea. And so that was, it was formed uh, just over a year ago in the summer of uh, 2015. Okay, got a question, Mark? Yeah, so um, again, I'm gonna mispronounce this. I think it's Reda Benzer, Benzer asks, um, what are the conditions or criteria to be included in the landscape that you were just uh, showing a few slides back? I think you've got to be able to use GitHub to file a pull request. Um, <laughs> I think that you've got to convince the, uh, the, the committers who are Dan Conn, who's the executive director of the CNCF and the two uh, bench capitalists named Scott Rainey and Lenny Pruss respectively at Redpoint and amplify that, that your project is, um, you know, of sufficient merit to, to get in there. Now in the future, they're planning to have slightly more, formal rules than that like you know 
something that represents the project has been around for a little while, has a reasonable number of users, uh, but at the moment it's still rather ad hoc. Um, so I would encourage you to just sort of throw your hat into the ring, do your best, and don't be too annoyed if you get a bit of pushback. But uh, it is, it is the, the aim is to have a fair and open mechanism for just showing people what things look like right now. Uh, Justin Garrison's just posted a link to a Google, um, uh, what's the word, survey uh, that apparently people are filling out around their usage around cloud native right now. I would encourage you to go and uh, put your information in there or to read it and see what other people are doing. Uh, another question coming in, um, how is the CNCF related to OCI? Ah, good question. So before I answer that, I just want to say Justin is writing a book on cloud native. So if anybody wants to help him with that, I know that he's looking for uh, examples, thoughts, contributors, all kinds of things. Uh, go, go hit him up on the cloud native Slack, please. So OCI, OCI is another sub foundation of the Linux Foundation. And there's a really, really key difference between OCI and CNCF. O OCI is aiming specifically to create a standard around um, container technology, a, a bit like HTTP or TCP before it. And it, it, the ITF is a well-known standards body for getting network standards together and internet standards. I think it's, it should be seen in that light. It, it, it's, it has very clear deliverables around uh, having a finished 1.0 specification that uh, everybody can then go away and implement. So it's very, very important to get that right. So you know, as it gets closer and closer and closer to being finished, uh, you know, the arguments get you know, more and more interesting and complicated. But the end result, if everybody uh, has enough common will, will be to have a spec that everybody can say is what a container actually is at least in 1.0 version, and maybe in the future 2.0, who knows? Um, whereas CNCF is not about standards. CNCF is about project set education, and that's a different set of criteria. So we actually encourage people to just move as fast as they can and work with one another, and we don't encourage people to try and standardize uh, prematurely. Um, we don't form committees to um, hammer out disagreements, although there are working groups forming to try and understand patterns, um, but we're not, we're, we're the S word is, is essentially banned. Uh, the, the chat is blowing up right now, but no specific questions. So uh, you can continue and I'll, I'll probably interrupt you in a few slides. Well, I mean, if you guys want to break off and have your meeting, that's absolutely fine. I <laughs> We're just, I we don't need you anymore. You've just been the catalyst for a good discussion. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Well, we have got too long to go, so maybe we can all chat at the end. Um, so, you know, common open source is, is the mission here coming out of this idea of let's doing it, do it together. And um, it's a, it's, it means something that's not proprietary, you know, big and small organizations coming together to do things together. And why is this important? It's because um, of that Mark Andreessen quote from that picture I showed earlier, you know, software is eating the world. And, oh, if you hadn't noticed, open source has been eating software, but something else has been eating open source, and that's cloud. And, you know, we all know and love the wonderful cloud providers, Amazon, Azure, and Google. But it is a little bit worrying that you know there could be a world in which that they are the only things that exist. Uh, so we would love to be able to have a little bit of freedom in that world. So we think open source is part of that. Um, and without a commons, we risk potentially cloud lock-in, um, which could be scary if you're a small furry animal or a uh, or a company. And so here are some things about foundations that I think are important. Uh, they curate open source to ameliorate lock-in. I put stop in the headline here because ameliorate was too long and wouldn't fit. But you know they are there to help people have a have a route B, a plan B. Um, now that everybody's got involved in open source, it's this this really does make sense that we should share the, the boring infrastructure. And, and you know the big cloud providers are going to run this for us, so they win too. Foundations provide education. They can basically provide a shared resource pooling, uh, thought leadership, uh, materials, and a mechanism for cross-referencing them and, and, and essentially surfacing the good stuff and demoting the bad stuff, a bit like a, you know, Wikimedia does for general information. Um, they can create an implicit or explicit badge of trust, and uh, through operations like the TOC, which I'm a member of, we can identify quality and interoperability tools and examples. And we can share all these through the commons mechanism of the CNCF and the Linux Foundation. And I think that's very valuable because people are rather confused right now. So we're, well, our aim is to get rid of that confusion. I believe there is a question from the pipe. 
Yeah, that's right. So that's quite a relevant question for this slide. So um, I'm going to say Sigdam Aitikin asked um, about education. Where can we find the best resources for cloud native education? Um, I've mentioned a few already. I mean, I think the slide decks that I pointed out and Adrian Cockcroft is a sort of generator of these is good. The project pages. So the cncf.io page is a good place to start and the subprojects, Kubernetes, Prometheus, et cetera. You should go and just dig around in all of these things. All the participating companies like Weaveworks and Coros and others are keen to educate you as well. So go look at their websites. I think as time goes by, the CNCF website will grow and grow and become more of a kind of encyclopedia for this stuff. But today it is rather disparate. Um, I think it's worth mentioning in there as well that also we have, for example, Cloud Native Con, which is a fantastic place to come see talks about this kind of stuff. Next one's coming up in Berlin. So if you're in New Europe, that is convenient. Otherwise, there'll be one in the US at the end of the year. And obviously, these webinars. And there is also a fairly large meetup network around the world now. If you were to go to meetup.com and search for Cloud Native, you'd find that, um, I can't remember the exact number, but hundreds. So there's probably one near you where you can go and meet people and talk about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, no more questions right now, Alexis, you can continue. Okay, yeah, I mean, also, we forgot to mention Slack channels. I mean, that's, those are very lively places to learn stuff. Okay, so um, the last thing is foundation support open source projects. So, you know, projects should speak for themselves and then we can promote them. I think that's really important. Uh, and then we can make sure they play nicely with one another, which they're doing really voluntarily, which is great and talk about why, why that helps users as well to build cloud native apps faster. So those are the three areas I think foundations can really help bring this all to life. And somebody's already mentioned standards, so I'll be fairly brief here. But I just want to be clear that uh, standards, when done properly, are slow. And they generally emerge slowly, or they can be brought out early, but that tends to be you know, quite a complicated process. So you should enter that hesitantly and with great forethought. Um, what we're trying to do in CNCF, we don't think we need standards as such. We need ease of interoperability and we need glue. We like to find conventions that arise from the real world and, and are in use by the community. And if we see those and can identify them, we can promote them as needed and, and discuss them in working groups and try and find common ground um, for things like sort of storage and networking and, 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 and so on. But we're trying to avoid just sort of putting a stake in the ground and saying, this must be how networking is done, or this must be how volumes are done. Because I think that, that is, uh, you know, can inhibit innovation. And we're still at a reasonably early stage of this industry. And so that's a sort of picture of that plan, if you will. Um, we started out uh, trying to get moving quickly by bringing in some new projects that are cloud native and high quality and fast moving. And now we're trying to make them go faster Get, get wider use and bring them into an overall cloud native framework and story. And over time, you know, the community will figure out what the standard tools are and how they work. And there's a little blog post about this written by me months ago. I'm just linked to here if you want to read more about this concept. And so just to finish up my section, um, I think this is a really nice way of putting uh, what, when standards are useful in this early stage of the industry. Um, this is Bob Wise, who is a member of the CNCF board representing Samsung. Um, he said, I call upon the CNCF to formally foster a common community container implementation project backed by the key Kubernetes, Mesos, and Cloud Foundry communities. We need a transparent community-driven implementation to become the default container implementation for a wide number of open source orchestration systems. So, you know, here's, here's somebody calling for agreement between different projects. And I think one of the roles of the foundation, the CNCF and other foundations perhaps, is to foster that and clarify that agreement in order to help customers move more quickly and build apps that they want to build without worrying about the infrastructure anymore. So that's the end of my slides. I believe there's a couple more questions coming through. That's right, we've actually got three. Uh, I'm going to start with Krishna Kumar. He asks, uh, what's your opinion about legacy applications moving to cloud native? Should you just leave them where they are or create new apps? I mentioned microliths. I think that's an important pattern for a lot of applications. This is when you have a small monolithic application that could benefit from something like active passive replication. 
um, maybe using some you know load balancing trickery or some kind of volume replication trickery. This this is the kind of thing you do when you containerize um, legacy applications. Um, people call this lift and shift. I think it's an absolutely critical um, adoption path. I, this is why I said earlier I was a little bit skeptical about orchestration to begin with. I mean, there are so many other things that don't need to sort of all be transplanted onto Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and, and DCOS today, but, but could benefit from some rewriting. There are also things that don't necessarily need to be rewritten, but could get a bit of portability, a bit of flexibility with just a few, few you know, neat little tricks. So yes, I'm not against legacy applications at all. Um, another question coming in here. Um, so session such Deva says, uh, and this is a bit of a meta question, I guess. Could we say that cloud native is the new name or more appropriate category for born on cloud architecture? This is the same person who asked if it was the Apache of cloud native. I think right. the answer is yes. I think that's a reasonable uh, phrasing. I think born in the cloud or written as if born in the cloud. So people may not actually be writing these things on Amazon, Google, or Azure or another cloud provider, but they might have that in mind. Um, they might be using something like OpenStack and think that if they've written it for OpenStack, it can be ported to Amazon later or run in both places at once. So I would, I would agree with the uh, questioner's uh, characterization. Okay, so um, there's one more here coming through. Let me have a quick look. Um, Sidetrack question, again from Session. Um, whenever I Google Cloud Native, it blows up with Cloud Foundry. If Cloud Foundry is a standard, then what would happen to other PaaS platforms like Google, AWS, and Azure PaaS? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which is I don't, a fairly wide question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that those PaaS is going to go away. I mean, um, you know, if you're writing a Ruby application on Amazon and you don't use Heroku, You've got to have a pretty good reason nowadays. I think um, the same same can be said of Node.js. Um, there are, you know, people say that you kind of outgrow Heroku after a while if you reach a certain size and scale. But um, you know, I don't think most people are going to be running off the cl Cloud Foundry. Um, you know, Cloud Foundry really came about to give people the the, the combination of a cloud native style runtime with a degree of portability with that kind of Heroku software life cycle where you just go out push and you can uh, bring all the changes with you. It's kind of really handy. Um, I think there are many more patterns than that in cloud native that we're discovering now. So I think, you know, the definition will probably expand faster than cloud Foundry's implementation can keep up. And I think cloud Foundry will be an important, but there's a case of cloud native, but, but by no means the only one. Right. Um, now, I'm gonna, there's one more question. Before I do that, I'm putting the link into the chat to everyone now for the next webinar that's coming up, and that's for Linkerd. Um, Linkerd is the newest edition uh, that we've announced for the CNCF as a project. Um, related to that, I've got a question for you, Alexis, which I think is very much in your wheelhouse. Uh, before we had a question about what criteria are there for getting on the roadmap, not the roadmap, the uh, What's the name of it again? The big diagram. Um, the landscape. The landscape, that's the word we use. Uh, my question is, what are the criteria for being accepted through the TOC as a CNCF project? Wow. Um, well, there is some stuff about that on the cncf.io website. Um, you see some uh, previous presentations before people are asked to present their, 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 their project informally on the uh, one of the working group TOC meetings. Um, this is a slideshow style presentation with a Q&A lasting about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there is then a period of contemplation followed by a much more formal proposal in a document and a TOC uh, member has to agree to sponsor that um, in order to move it forward. And then the sort of things we're looking for are has production users, um, is moving at high velocity, is, is, is visibly of high quality, um, you know, feels like it has a future, is well architected, is cloud native, stuff like that. I mean, we have written down some of these criteria, but, but those are the kind of the main ones. Uh, so we have another question coming in from Yash Thakar, and he says, is Golang like the native language for cloud native? Because uh, from what he can see, most cloud native tools are built with Golang these days. 
Well, we just brought Linkerd in as an inception project, which has got Finagle underneath it, which is written on, which runs on the JVM. Um, and there are a lot of good cloud native technologies out there, like uh, some of the Netflix OSS projects and um, some of the Spring projects as well, of course, written in Java. Um, there's things in Scala. Um, there are new things coming out in Rust. You know, one of the advantages of containers is you can put pretty much any software into a container regardless of the language. And I think you know, it would be wrong to assume that application development in cloud native is tied to a particular language. I think Go is clearly the popular choice of community built uh, container infrastructure today. But I don't think it's something that uh, you should see as a sort of hard and fast decision. And one more now in the uh, Q&A section, which is more of a uh, session sh such Deva uh, sharing a thought, which perhaps you can uh, comment on. He says, often I see cloud native is glued to containers and microservices, but he thinks the cloud mm. is actually in independent of the underlying infrastructure and can even exist. Well, once again, I, I find myself agreeing with Sashin here. Um, I tried to be rather explicit about this in the containers and microservices slide. I mean, you know, containers are here today. They are um, being used as a mechanism for packaging software and then running it in a standardized manner uh, such that the results should be at a certain scale consistent. Um, but there is talk of other types of granularity like uh, that might be enjoyed by unikernels or even functions, who knows. Um, also, the, the work container itself has preceded the rise of LXC and Docker and associated with Java containers. And if you talk to Cockroft, um, he will tell you that Netflix OSS CDI container model is basically JVM based still. Um, and with microservices as well, I think microservices is an aspect arising incidentally out of cloud native that is certainly a lot easier to do if you've got cloud type infrastructure in front of you. But there are other things like, you know, data flow processing, which I think can be called cloud native, which are not microservices. So there's lots and lots and lots of different cloud native patterns. Okay, thanks, Alexis. So that's, uh, just let me do a quick double check. Um, yeah, that's the last question that we've got. So all that's really left for me to do is to say, thank you very much to you, Alexis, for the presentation. I think that was very enlightening. No um, worries. I'm th at Monadic on Twitter if you want to send abusive notes. Oh yeah, actually. Uh, and people are now putting thanks, Alexis, in the chat. So that's uh, from them to you. I'm putting your Twitter handle in there. That's at Monadic. If you want to uh, find Alexis and follow him, you can uh, keep up with all the blogs and stuff that he's doing at Weaving with the CNCF over there. Uh, last thing I will say is that this video will be, um, it has been recorded and will be uploaded to, um, uh, to YouTube on the channel that I shared earlier. And again, I would encourage you to sign up for Linkerd because it'll give you an, it'll give you an overview of sort of what one of our projects is doing, which is another way of looking at some of the, uh, of the work here. 